So I think most of you know me. I'm Daniel Robbins, a, a professor in the department here. And I was asked to give a colloquium this semester. Um, and Philip said, you should give a colloquium about string theory. So that's what I'm gonna, gonna, gonna do. Even though a lot of my recent research is maybe not exactly string theory, but it's still very motivated and inspired by string theory and string theory examples. So I'm a little worried my talk might be on the long side, so I may not actually get to my research, but that's okay, I, I'm fine with that. I would like to really very much encourage many questions. This is the story of string theory, not the, you know, I want it, I want it to be a, you know, interactive if at all possible. So just, just holler out at, at any point. Okay, so to get started, we're gonna go way back to the 1960s. So the year is 1961, and at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, they had a nice little particle accelerator, and they turned it on, and new particles just came pouring out. Crazy things, they had no idea what they were. Uh, so a lot of them were named Rho, but there was a whole family of them. And so immediately people started looking for patterns, right? Patterns in the data. So in the data they found you know, a bunch of resonances indicating the, the presence of these particles, and they, they were able to identify you know, not just the mass of the particle, but also the spin, J. And it turned out that these particles, uh, well, the first few that they found obeyed a really nice relation where alpha naught and alpha prime were just some constants. So there was a linear relationship between the spin and the mass squared. They found a few more that didn't exactly fit it, but it turned out they fit on a different line with the same slope. So alpha prime was the same, but with a slightly different alpha naught. <laughs> And they found about two or three of these you know, lines and all the, the new particles, well, of a, you know, a certain class, all fit really nicely on these lines. And so the question was, why on earth was this true? Nobody really knew what was going on with these particles, any of this. So there was this really cool idea that a few people came up with, so Veneziano, and then later there was work by Nambu and Susskind and uh, Holger Beck Nielsen. The idea was, well, if they weren't actually particles, if they were little vibrating strings, you can actually show that this kind of relation comes out very naturally. So they got hard to work on this, this idea. We have these little quantum strings that vibrate, and so what we're seeing as different particles are just sort of different vibrational modes of these little strings. And Everything, you know, this, this relation comes up very nicely, but there were a few problems. So you do this and you're kind of confronted with a couple things that didn't match experiment. So one thing that jumped out is that you predict a massless particle, pretty much no matter how you go about it, you get this massless particle with spin two. The, the experiments weren't seeing any massless particles coming out. So that was, that was not so great. And then, Another theory came along, quantum chromodynamics. So developed by, well, a bunch of people, uh, many of whom won the Nobel Prize. Um, and in quantum chromodynamics, it actually explained things perfectly. These particles are what we would now call, uh, you know, mesons with a quark and an antiquark. It's a bound state of a quark and an antiquark. And it turns out that because of the way the strong force works, this quark and an antiquark are sort of effectively tied together by a flux tube. And the further you try to pull them apart, the tighter that tube gets. And so it behaves very much like a string, a string with a quark and an antiquark on either end. And so that's why we saw that relation, was because these are basically strings, but they're sort of effective composite strings, not the fundamental quantum strings that these other guys were playing with. Uh, but QCD was clearly the right theory to, to describe everything coming out of these accelerators. And so I think most of the field said, okay, great, we'll just, we'll just move along. But a few people said, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Let, let's go back and look. Did you say you got a massless spin two particle coming out of your quantum theory that you wrote down? And, you know, yes, Veneziano had a massless spin two particle coming out of his quantum theory. That's really, really exciting for people who are paying attention. Because even by the 1960s, quantum gravity had been recognized for decades as a really interesting, difficult problem that nobody had any idea how to solve. But Weinberg proved a theorem, you know, a little, also in the 60s, I'm not sure exactly what order things happened, 
But he proved that if you have a massless spin two field, basically the only way you can consistently couple it is via gravity. It becomes the graviton. Its couplings give you general relativity, at least a linearized order. And then, you know, you can actually go higher orders in, in fields and so on. So that spin two massless particle made people really excited. So I'm going to take a, a little detour now, and you know, again, this is a good place for questions if anybody has them. I'm going to take a little detour through why quantum gravity was such an interesting problem to people. So already at this point, modern, you know, fundamental physics, and you know, what was modern in 1960s is still kind of modern today, I have to say, rests on two really you know, fundamental pillars here. On the one hand, we've got general relativity. So Einstein told us how to you know, sort of appropriately modify what you know, Newton had said about gravity, very much inspired by electromagnetism. So in electromagnetism, you, you know, were led to postulate the existence of the electric and magnetic fields as a way to sort of mediate the, you know, the forces between things to, to solve certain problems. Very similarly, Einstein suggested there's a gravitational field that mediates gravitational interactions. Um, so this is a, a purely classical field theory, like classical electromagnetism. And you know, that field is called the, the space-time metric. Basically tells you how to measure distances locally in space-time. And it, it's a great theory. It is spectacularly well confirmed. So we've got the, the perihelion precession of Mercury was done you know, early on, and, and this you know, famous experiment or observation, I should say, of, of the light bending around the sun during a total eclipse. These were done in Einstein's lifetime. Uh, much more recently, LIGO you know, measured the infalling collapse of you know, black hole merger. There was this uh, you know, blurry but exciting picture of the, the black hole at the center of, center of the galaxy. All of this, actually that one, I can't remember if that one's the one at the Milky Way or the other one. But all of these fit perfectly with Einstein's theory of general relativity, right? Everything's great. Any questions so far? Okay. Yes? Yeah, and nowhere in there has H-bar made an appearance. H-bar has definitely not yet made an appearance in the discussion of general relativity. Yes, correct. Absolutely true. So let's, uh, let's get some H-bars going. So quantum field theory. First came quantum mechanics, um, said, hey, all those notions you had of how the world works. Uh, yeah, things are much weirder than you thought. Um, in quantum mechanics, we make predictions not by sort of solving some equations and figuring out exactly what something does, at least in you know, many standard interpretations. We do some kind of weighted average over all possible paths that your particle could have t taken. Uh, that weighted average uses you know, the action uh, to, to build your weight factor. But that's, that's, an, that's a strange idea. But again, you know, seems to actually work pretty well. So from quantum mechanics, we go to quantum field theory. I'm not going to step through the details there because that would take a while. But it's, quantum field theory is the language we use for modern particle physics, right? It's the language of the standard model. And this theory is actually even better tested than general relativity. This is a really, 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 really well-confirmed theory. Um, and I guess partly here, I mean, you know, in particular, quantum field theory is really, really, you know, works really, really well. So the standard model, there might be stuff just around the corner that we haven't seen, so there might be small anomalies here and there. But quantum field theory works really well. We just had a talk on G minus 2. The best, what was it, the, the most accurately measured uh, quantity in, in science, basically. This is an old measurement, obviously. <laughs> you think this must be for the electron? Yeah, I think this is for the electron, yeah. Not, yeah, that's right. We had to talk about the mu on G minus 2. But. Well, you did talk about the electron during the talk as well. Okay. So, fantastic. We've got two brilliantly confirmed theories. Everything is wonderful. We can predict stuff everywhere we want. Uh, that's, that's great. <laughs> Very happy for us. <laughs> so theoretical particle physics are, you know, 
We're, it's not in our nature to be happy, really. We're, <laughs> so we're always finding something to complain about. So in particular, well, what about when both GR and quantum field theory should be important? You know, okay, sure, it doesn't happen very often. You might have to go inside a black hole or back to the beginning of the universe or something. But in principle, it can happen. What happens then? I need to know. So to talk about when these different theories become important, so now we're going to go to the h-bar that, that Keith mentioned, right? I need to introduce some fundamental constants. So we've got the speed of light. C is, uh, you know, that's pretty fast. For objects that go much slower than this, Newton's laws are great. Uh, but if you, oh, that's a bad typo. Uh, if you go very fast, then, then you need Einstein's special relativity. Then we've got gravity. So again, Newton gave us a gravitational constant. Um, it basically tells you how far the gravitational forces are of a system, and you can compare them to any other forces that are around. And then turn of the century, Planck gives us a constant, h-bar. Uh, and that tells you basically when quantum mechanics becomes important. So essentially, comparing the scales of your problem to these things in appropriate units sort of tells you what type of theory you need to, to take into account. So there's sort of this cube of theory space, uh, very heuristic. But so classical mechanics, which uh, I think some of my students are in, in the audience maybe, it's down here. That's right at the origin. So you've got a ways to go. Um, turn on the speed of light, you go to special relativity. Or if you turn on gravity, you go to Newtonian gravity. If you want to go fast and have gravity, then you need Einstein, general relativity. But then there's quantum mechanics. So that's when h-bar becomes relevant. So over on this face of the cube, h-bar is 0. And we're, we're in a classical world. But over here, we're in a quantum world. So non-relativistic quantum mechanics would be here. Turn on relativity, you end up with quantum field theory. But now if you also want gravity, quantum gravity lives up here. That's where we'd like to be. That's where we... That's a hard question, though. A hard question that was recognized as a hard question pretty darn early. Uh, so this is a paper by Born from the 1930s. Uh, I think there are some papers by Rosen that was on quantum gravity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, clearly an old question that had bedeviled, you know, Einstein spent years trying to figure it out as well. And now this, this crazy massless spin two particle just falls out of this you know, quantizing string. So why was it so hard? Well, gravity is what we call non-renormalizable, um, which in some sense means it's incomplete as a, a full quantum theory. It's fine if you put a cutoff and say, I only care about things below my cutoff. Um, but if you want to do better than that, then essentially non-renormalizable means that you'd have to specify sort of an infinite number of different pieces of information in order to specify this theory to, to higher energies. So back to that failed attempt, it was, you know, got its lunch stolen by QCD. Um, that massless spin two field indicates that this quantum theory of strings contains a field like gravity. Quantum gravity just falls out and you know, what happened to those infinite set of parameters that I said you need to specify gravity? String theory has an answer. It gives you those infinite set of parameters, or at least tells you how to compute them one by one. They're, it's very explicit, uh, at least you know, now it is. It wasn't really in the 60s, but that's what the intervening decades have straightened out. So now before I continue my story with the development of string theory, so again, this is a good place for a pause for questions. Seeing, seeing none. Uh, before we continue the story of the development of string theory, I want to kind of indulge in, in a different thing here. Um, so I'm going to give the alternate history of string theory. So what I really have in mind actually is how are we going to talk about string theory? How's it going to be taught in 50 years? Right? What, what is the, if it's going to be taught in 50 years? <laughs> yeah, I'm never happy, but I'm always optimistic. <laughs> So how's it, how's it actually going to be taught? Because, you know, it took certainly decades for quantum mechanics to really make its way into the curriculum. You know what? Maybe string theory too. So I'm going to give you 
and I, I'm really cribbing this part of the talk from a, a, a very nice essay uh, and talk by, by Witten uh, that he gave for the uh, centenary of great general relativity. Um, and I'm you know, just kind of skimming it, but. All right, quantum gravity is hard. Or at least it's very hard in four dimensions where we happen to live. By the way, being a string theorist, the number of dimensions is always the space-time dimension. Uh, you know, sometimes I was cognizant of that when I was writing the talk, and we'll refer to spatial dimensions, but most of the time we live in four dimensions, three space and one time. So I want to try something easier. So let me try something less than four. Let me try quantum gravity in one dimension. Okay, well, whatever quantum gravity is, so gravity is supposed to be, you know, the, the actual geometry of space-time is part of your, your physics. This is just time. This is just time, correct. Right. Yes, exactly. No space, just time. Um, so quantum gravity should involve something like a path integral over geometries, weighted by a factor of the action. Um, and in general relativity in arbitrary dimensions, your action looks something like this. You've got Einstein-Hilbert, the, you've got the Ricci curvature scalar, you've got a cosmological constant piece perhaps, and then you've got some matter fields that couple the things. Now there's a big problem if I'm in only one dimension. It turns out that that Ricci scalar, which is essentially the kinetic term for the gravi graviton, for the gravity field, uh, is just automatically zero in one dimension. There's just no way to write a curvature scalar intrinsically in one dimension. So I don't have a kinetic term for my, for my metric. Um, maybe that's a problem, but I can still talk about the fluctuating metric. It just has one component, GTT. So what if it doesn't have a kinetic term? It's a Lagrange multiplier. That, that we know how to deal with. Now, if I just stuck with that and just had the, you know, only the cosmological constant term, okay, that's too boring. So I will have to couple some matter. So let me just add some scalar fields. I'm going to put in n different scalar fields, call, the, call them xi. And um, I've also suggestively renamed the cosmological constant term here, which will come up in a minute. I've renamed it as m squared. It's just a number. So we follow the usual thing. So we would have some generalized momenta to our scalar fields, I'll call those PI. And then I have to take into account, because my metric is now a Lagrange multiplier, I can just impose its equation. It's basically a constraint on my system. And that constraint is P squared plus M squared is zero. That is, uh, well, sorry, let me first translate that to language of a wave function. Because what are we doing here? I'm claiming to do a quantum theory in one dimension. That's what quantum mechanics should be. So this is a quantum mechanics, but somehow a quantum mechanics coupled to one dimensional gravity. Um, so in terms of a quantum mechanical wave function, the wave function would depend on my x's. Um, my p's would turn into you know, i times derivatives. I think I've set h bar here to one perhaps, but, uh, and so I'll get this, this uh, equation here that my wave function will satisfy. This is, this thing has a name. This is called the Klein-Gordon equation. And this is what you would have for a scalar field theory in n dimensions. Unfortunately, in n Euclidean dimensions. But actually, I can get away with that. that that's fine. I'm just going to, Ariel won't be happy, but I'm just going to wick rotate one of my scalars. Uh, so I'll just flip the sign of the kinetic term for one of the scalars. Call that one x0. Uh, and then this equation that comes out is, becomes exactly the standard Klein-Gordon equation. Okay, I think that's kind of cool. So we just thought about quantum gravity in one dimension, and what fell out was a quantum field theory in n dimensions. This is sort of a, it's sort of a first quantized versus second quantized kind of picture. This is the theory that lives on the world line of a particle, essentially. But the equations all match. I'll, I'll even do a little better in the next slide or two. Psi is a wave function, wave functional in some sense, okay. perhaps, yeah. But I think the problem is that I'm going to uh, that Yeah, good. So I'm reinterpreting, yeah, that's a great point. I think I'm reinterpreting it as a field in the target space-time, yeah. 
Yeah. So, so your treatment of time is perfectly legit until you need a fake weak translation uh, rotation. So I think my treatment of time on the world line is still legit. Yeah. yeah. My treatment of time in target space is a little less legit. Yes. But the claim is it, it's still it's still reasonable. So in fact, let's try to push this a little further. So I still have to do this integral over one-dimensional geometries. Well, luckily in one dimension, there's not really much you can do. So if you're sticking with connected geometries, well, I could do a circle, I could do a line, and then I'm fresh out of ideas, right? So that's pretty good. Um, so this, this slide's a little more technical, so don't worry too much if you don't entirely follow. But if I want to now take this all seriously and describe a transition amplitude for what I'm now wanting to interpret as a particle moving in n dimensions, from some point x to some point y in the n-dimensional target space, the field space, what I would do is I would, I would take line segment with the boundary conditions that the xi's live at little x or little y on either end of that line segment. Um, and I would compute some transition amplitude. And doing that in the standard kind of way, so here, I can use my freedom to change coordinates in one dimension. This is, I'm doing one dimensional gravity, so that's basically a gauge symmetry of my theory. It's one dimensional diffeomorphisms. Uh, if I do that, there's actually exactly one invariant quantity for my line segment. It's the proper length, the integral uh, over time of GTT to the one half. That won't change if I change coordinates, but Everything else I can basically change. In particular, I could change coordinates so the GTT was just one everywhere. And then this tau is just the range of t. t goes from zero to tau. So I'm going to take that point of view rather than explicitly integrating over the metric, which is probably a little bit more in the spirit of how we ought to do things. But they're completely equivalent. So if I do that, do a little bit of work, you get this matrix element relating you know, as a transition amplitude. Uh, and tau shows up here, and our you know, p squared plus m squared shows up here. Uh, so this p squared is now like a, you know indefinite signature square. Yeah? So then isn't the transition amplitude from initial point to final point? Yeah, so I, I want, I'm, I'm, so in the language of the 1D theory, I'm just putting in boundary conditions for my fields. I'm saying that xi at time zero is you know, all the xi's at time zero go to this point little x, and all the xi's at time tau go to this little y. And then the paths are the different Right now I'm fixing a path and getting a transition amplitude just using my quantum mechanics. But then I will integrate over, and on the bottom line here, I integrate over geometries, which basically just amounts to integrating over tau. Integrating over tau or integrating over tau? Also so, um... Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, I guess this is integrating over paths. You're right. This is, this is integrating over different paths, but where I could have, I haven't yet integrated over the parameter tau, which is parameterizing my segment. But this is over what the xi's are doing in the target space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, from the one dimensional point of view, they're matter in this one dimensional quantum mechanics sort of you know, one-dimensional field theory. And I'm secretly trying to push the interpretation that they can be thought of as the coordinates of a particle in n-dimensional space-time. So, whether or not you believe my words around these things, I claim that the equations are kind of nice because what I get, this propagator at the bottom here, this is exactly what you would find if you opened the appropriate page of Peshkin and Schroeder and checked what is the propagator for a scalar field in n dimensions, uh, you know, the, a free scalar field, what is the propagator? This is the correct thing. If, if you're very careful with things, I'm told you even get all the I epsilons and everything right as well. So we can argue about the interpretation, but this seems to be a way to get the equations of quantum field theory out. Again, just by starting, starting just by thinking about one-dimensional quantum gravity. So that, that's, I think, a pretty cool message, which is why I wanted to do this 
alternate history uh, section in the middle. Uh, let me just make a couple more comments about the 1D case. So this was only a free field theory. To get interactions, you have to be a little bit more ad hoc. So you have to now include, you have to say, in my integral over all one-dimensional manifolds, well, it's not going to be manifolds anymore. I have to include things that have these singularities, these junctions. And I have to make some choice of exactly what kind of action I'm going to associate with each of those junctions. But if I do that, I can do, the, do a path integral. And the claim is you can basically reverse engineer what, you know, for whatever Feynman rules you wanted, for whatever theory you were studying, you can reverse engineer a one-dimensional quantum gravity theory that produces everything. Is, is that formula you had before related at all with Schwinger? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So tau is the Schwinger parameter in, the, in QFT. Absolutely right. Okay, so again, we're, we've interpreted a one-dimensional quantum gravity theory, which is what we set out to just write down. Now is the theory living on the world line of a particle, and we can basically get more or less any QFT that we want this way. We don't get anything new. I mean, we, you know, you're still doing the same calculations you would have done from Peshkin and Schroeder at the end of the day, but it's, it's an interesting route to get there, I would say. Okay, well, I'm, I, I'm feeling completely flush with success with, with that uh, little exercise. So let's, let's be bold and try to do quantum gravity in two dimensions. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the details here nearly as much, but this is basically what you do in the first few weeks of a string theory course, essentially. Uh, so in two dimensions, the, you do have curvature, so that's a wrinkle. Two-dimensional spaces can be curved. Uh, so that... Ritchie scalar is not necessarily zero, so I have to include that. And there are a lot more 2D spaces. It's not just the line segment anymore. Um, and the other problem is that I can't just use... So in one dimension, I was able to use my change of coordinates to just set my metric equal to one. And that made my life quite a bit simpler in terms of the actual calculations that I didn't actually do. Uh, in two dimensions, so I have two functions I can do as changes of coordinates, but my metric has three functions in it. So I can only get rid of two of those three functions. But you play around a little bit. You're, you're undaunted, because again, particle theorists are optimistic, just not happy. And so you stare at the two-dimensional Einstein-Hilbert-Lagrangian for a little while, the action, and you say, hey, wait, there's another local symmetry in this thing. I can rescale my metric by any function. So send g mu nu to a function times g mu nu. And that's actually a symmetry of the two-dimensional Einstein-Hilbert action, provided I turn off the cosmological constant. The cosmological constant actually ruins it, but if I leave that off, that is actually another symmetry. So that, if I then say, oh, okay, I'm just going to declare that that's also going to be a gauge symmetry, just like I wanted diffeomorphisms to be, because I'm doing gravity. So I'm doing, I guess, conformal gravity or something like that. If I do that, then I can use that extra function so that at least locally I can make my metric just constant again, flat. That is true. So good. Uh, yeah, I wasn't going to talk about that, but that's absolutely correct. The the R part of the Einstein-Hilbert term in two dimensions is purely topological. It's the Euler density, and it just measures the Euler character. And there's a beautiful story, which I think you already know, about that in, in string theory, but ain't got time for it. Any other questions? All right. So once you've committed to saying that I can also use conformal transformations in addition to just changes of coordinates, so I can also rescale my metric, uh, then your life gets much better. So rather than this crazy, complicated, infinite dimensional space of two-dimensional surfaces that you have to worry about, it turns out that you just have to worry about surfaces up to, and I'm, I'm glossing over some other things here, but roughly speaking up to genus, that's the number of handles your surface has, that sort of labels it as a topological class. And then within each genus, you just have a finite number of parameters, analogous to the tau we had before. 
So in 1D, it was the length of the, the proper length of our line segment. For 2D, if you've got a torus, there's a, you know, one complex parameter that you also have to specify. For a two genus surface, there's uh, three complex parameters, and you know, it goes, goes from there. But it's finite, so that means that when properly set up, my path integral over two-dimensional geometries is really just going to be basically ordinary integrals over the, well, over these uh, you know, finite set of parameters. Well, it'll be a sum over genus, and then for each term in that sum, a finite set of integrals. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, no handy coffee mugs. So, it's really just like a sphere, you say, has no handles. If you've got, yeah, if you've got a handle attached to the sphere, so a donut or a standard coffee mug, that's one handle. That's a genus one thing. If I've got two handles, that's a different thing. The point being that um, with smooth deformations between them, I can change the shape of my surface a lot, but I can never change the number of handles. And so that's definitely, you know, a dividing line between different surfaces is how many handles does it have? And then the extra point I'm making here is that it, once you factor in these conformal transformations, once you say how many handles it has, it's just a finite dimensional space of things I have to worry about. Yeah. So when you do that, has a cosmological process, does that prevent me from exploring conformal symmetries? Um, good. So we have to be careful here to distinguish. So conformal symmetry is a, that's a scaling symmetry that I can have for theories in any dimensions, uh, usually associated with non-gravitational theories. So here, what I should actually have called the symmetry, I kept saying conformal, and I've, I know I've corrected other people on this, I should probably have called this a vial symmetry. So vial symmetry, the rescaling of the metric, that's only that only really has a shot of being a symmetry in two dimensions. Um, and then it turns out that after you gauge fix it, the stuff you have left has a conformal symmetry, which is why I'm using that term. But conformal symmetries are a much broader, you know, much more broadly uh, applicable thing. Yeah. So would it be fair to say that in two dimensions, yeah. if I have the cosmological yes. You have no vial symmetry and yeah. None of this, none of this works. Then, two D gravity with a cosmological constant, I think, is still pretty hard. I don't think I know how to do it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, let me answer that in two slides. Yeah. Yeah. You have developed this idea of gravity mm -hmm. by starting with an analogy with electromagnetism. I did, yeah. Both guide interactions. Mm -hmm. and but there is one thing that gravity does that electromagnetism doesn't, which mm -hmm. is that the metric tensor in addition to the field, blah, 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 it determines distances. That's true. Okay, so now the question is, is the moment that you start introducing this scale transformation, mm -hmm. the symmetry and the scale mm -hmm. transformation, do you lose the notion of distance? Yeah, in some sense you do. Um, in some sense, you do. The metric gives you more than distance. It also gives you angles, and you don't lose them. No, that's a but, yes, yes. Exactly, yeah. But the, distance but the, scale, yeah. the scale is gone. Yeah. The problem is with the Not at a distance. Not at a distance, yeah. yeah locally, yes. Locally, yes, yeah. That's right. Any other questions? Okay. So, uh, yeah, one other point. So, okay, we've gone to two dimensions. Uh, so now instead of line segments, we've got these interesting surfaces. Um, any of the Feynman diagrams I could have you know, been imagining before, I can now fatten them out into surfaces. Um, and the really nice thing there is that if you remember in 1D, in terms of like smooth manifolds, all I had was the line segment. So to add interactions, I had to say, oh, I'm going to artificially by hand say I'm also including these trivalent vertices or whatever, and at those vertices, I'm going to do this extra thing. And it was a little bit more ad hoc. In two dimensions, that's gone. 
the interactions are just there. So the smooth spaces in two dimensions already have these inter interactions built in. Uh, and so if your theory in 2D is you know, fairly constrained already, you, you can't, there's no ad hoc changes you can, you can do to it at that point. So that's, that's one sense in which it's a bit nicer than 1D, I would say. Um, so if we continue to play the same game, again, I'm not going to go through the details, but you know, the interpretation is that it's strings moving in n dimensions now. So I'm again going to take n scalar fields. Now they're n scalar fields in my two-dimensional <coughs> field theory with gravity. And I'll reinterpret those as the coordinates for a string moving around in, in n dimensions. Um, I didn't say it in the 1D case. I could have, but I didn't have to take flat space in the target space. I could introduce a metric on the target space that would just be couplings in the kinetic terms for my scalars. I could do that, and I could do it here as well. Um, and if you look at the spectrum of the, you know, the particles, you again see this massless spin two guy coming out. But there's another perspective on, on how, on why quantum gravity is coming out in this case and not in the 1D case. And that's that, so in both 1D and 2D, if I wanted to change the metric in target space, in my n-dimensional space, I would do that by deforming my action, by adding this coupling term to my action. So if delta big G is how I want to deform my n-dimensional metric, I would add this operator. In 1D, okay, that's just some deformation. Uh, doesn't do anything for me. But in two-dimensional theories with this kind of scaling symmetry, it turns out that there's actually a one-to-one -one correspondence between operators and states. And so the fact that I have an operator that can deform my space-time metric actually tells me that I must have a state that corresponds to a graviton in, in the n-dimensional space-time. So again, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of saying words here, but take, take my word for it, it's cool. <laughs> now, up until now, the axis yeah. were the dynamical objects. They are, they, are, they are dynamical objects from the two-dimensional theory point of view. They're scalar fields. Where does G, the capital G, get its dynamics? Those are couplings. The capital Gs are couplings in the 2D theory. They're couplings. Yeah. So you might ask, you know, one of the things you could ask is where does, you know, the equations of motion for n-dimensional Einstein-Hilbert gravity come? You know, how, how do I get those? And there's different ways to do it. So one way is you can just do string scattering experiments, which translates into some correlation functions in your 2D theory. And you can just kind of reverse engineer what the action should be, and you find Einstein-Hilbert. Another answer, which is more slick, is that your 2D theory, after you do some gauge fixing, is, as I mentioned to Keith's question, conformal, which means that its beta functions should all vanish. It should be scale invariant, so all the couplings should not flow as you change scale. And the vanishing of the beta functions for the, these couplings gives you the Einstein equations. So this is the ultimate induced gravity kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, trying to do quantum gravity in two dimensions uh, magically gave us quantum gravity in n dimensions. Now, again, it's kind of a first quantized versus second quantized. We're, we're getting the theory on the world sheet of strings, but we can argue that it's corresponding to, to gravity in n dimensions. Um, okay, so I think now we're ready to go back to our, our story that we started with. Any, any questions about the mirror universe? All right, moving on. Okay, so we found a gra quantum gravity theory, but I will now confess to you there are a bunch of problems that I didn't mention. So I'm mentioning them now. Okay, well, there are more massless fields than just the graviton. Uh, there's a massless scalar and a massless anti-symmetric tensor. Um, okay, so that's, yeah, maybe that's a problem, maybe not. Um, there were no particles that looked like electrons and quarks because there were no fermions in my theory. Okay, that's probably a bigger problem because we're pretty sure that fermions exist. Um, Oh, by the way, in order for this to be consistent at the quantum level, it turned out that that number of dimensions n actually has to be a very specific number. So we would like it to be 4, meaning we have 3 plus 1 dimensions in our target space. Uh, it actually has to be 26. 
So we are getting a theory of quantum gravity, but it's a theory of quantum gravity in 25 plus 1 dimensions. We should call it, we can be dimension, but it's quantum dimension. This is true. This is true. Yes, I, I, and I, maybe I'll say something about that in a bit. Yeah, you're, uh, that's certainly true. But there are other problems. <laughs> and then number four, uh, which Veneziano already net recognized because there was this poll in his amplitude that he wrote down, uh, there's a tachyon in this theory. So if you've watched too much Star Trek, then <laughs> you have some impression of tachyon, time tra travel. <laughs> uh, it's a particle that moves faster than light. All of that is not true. Okay? So a tachyon is, is an excitation whose, you know, if you interpret it as a particle, its mass squared is the opposite sign. And so by special relativity, indeed, it's, you know, it would move on a space-like world line instead of time-like. You should not interpret it as a particle. You should interpret it as an instability. So massive particles are what you get when you oscillate around a minimum, and the mass corresponds to the concavity of your potential. A tachyon says, you are not at a minimum. You are at a maximum, or a, a, maybe a saddle point. This is not a particle that will live for a long time, because your whole thing is not going to live for a long time. You're going to roll down the hill. And then your description is just not valid anymore. That's what a tachyon means. A tachyon means your theory is unstable. So not as exciting as the time traveling you know, spaceships, but also a big problem for the theory. So one of the problems actually turns out not to be a problem. So there's, there's the thing Hassan said, which is that, OK, it, they're only interpreted as a dimension if you really insist that you're thinking about strings moving in some space. And there's actually other ways to soup up your theory with different types of internal degrees of freedom. But also, even if you are just thinking about your strings as moving in some target space, the fact that that target space has to be 25 plus 1 dimensions instead of 3 plus 1 dimensions is not actually as big a problem as you would think. This was actually goes back, so it, this was a problem that had a, there was a solution that was looking for a problem for many years. Like way back in the early days of general relativity, I think in the 20s, Kaluza and Klein, maybe even in the teens, I'm not sure. Uh, so work independently by Kaluza, Kaluza and Klein said, okay, let's take Einstein's theory and put it in five dimensions, but I'm going to imagine that one of the spatial directions is compact, meaning it's a circle instead of infinite. What happens? Well, what happens is kind of like with this tightrope walker. So, you know, she sees the tightrope as a one-dimensional space, but for the ant, with the very blurry ant near her foot, uh, the tightrope is clearly a two-dimensional surface. It can go around the tightrope or along the tightrope. But from the much larger perspective, you, you can't really tell that it's not just a one-dimensional object. We can make that precise with equations, right? So you take Einstein's theory, you put in, you do exactly this and reduce it. So you get, um, you get a bunch of massless fields, so the four-dimensional metric, which you want. You get an electric and magnetic field. That's pretty cool. So they were like, oh, wow, we get E and M and gravity unified. Fantastic. Uh, we also get a massless scalar field, less fantastic, because we hadn't seen any of those and still have not. Uh, and then there's a bunch of infinite towers of mass massive fields. Basically, these are coming from Fourier expanding in that circle direction. So the zero modes of the Fourier expansion give you the massless guys, and the higher modes give you massive guys. So unification of gravity and E&M, fantastic. Tower of massive particles. Uh, they're actually not a problem if the space is small enough. So R here is the radius of that circle. And to actually see those massive particles, their, ra their masses all go like one over the radius. So unless you have energies, unless you've got a collider that can probe energies that big, so if R is very small, then you wouldn't have seen them. No conflict with, with anything we looked at. Unfortunately, the other bits do conflict with, with what we've looked at. We don't have a massless scalar field. Uh, even somewhat worse, the gravity and electromagnetic couplings would have to be of the same order because they're coming from the same source. And that is definitely not true in our universe. Gravity is way weaker than E&M, uh, despite what you feel when you fall down the stairs. Um, but it turns out this is a really rich 
grain of an idea. So if you've got more directions to curl up, if it's not just a circle, but some more complicated manifold, there's a lot of games you can play. There's a lot of room to, to try to tinker around with those extra dimensions and see what you can get. So that is actually, that turns out not to be a problem. What about the other problems? The tachyon in particular, that was the real killer. Well, supersymmetry came along. People suggested this uh, idea of supersymmetry. Again, I'm not gonna do the details, so supersymmetry is some symmetry that exchanges bosons and fermions. Uh, it's a theoretical construct, but if you basically say, I'm gonna try to do everything we just did with you know, two-dimensional gravity coupled to matter, but I'm gonna try to build it in a supersymmetric way in two, in the, on the two-dimensional world sheet, then you can do that. Uh, the tachyon goes away. The number of extra dimensions, you go down from 26 to 10, which maybe is an improvement, maybe not, I don't know. Still not four, but that's, you know, it's, it's progress. It's more than halfway. Um, now the theory can accommodate fermions, because you've got fermions that you put in there, exchanging with the bosons. Um, if, you're, if you're not compact, if you're not curling up your extra dimensions, then you only get very specific you know, matter content. But if you, once you start curling up and looking at the effective three plus one dimensional theory, depending on the details of your geometry, you can get all sorts of things. Um, so this worked really well. So this is super string people, theory. People got very excited. Everything seemed consistent. It seemed we now had a consistent uh, theory of quantum gravity. It was not unstable. Looked great. So there's a few other properties of the theory that are gonna be relevant uh, in the time I won't have. So this theory comes with extended objects. So it turns out string theory doesn't just have strings. It also has membranes and higher dimensional objects and things like that as well. So we weren't creative enough to come up with different names for each dimension object. So we just call them all brains, uh, which also lends itself well to lots of puns, which is again, turning bugs into features. Um, and again, because of the richness of the six dimensional geometry you can, you can access, you get lots and lots and lots of different low energy effective theories. This might be a feature that turns into a bug, depending who you talk to, because it could be that you could basically get almost any effective four dimensional physics you wanted by doing whatever you do with the internal geometry stuff. And at that point, things are maybe not necessarily so predictive. Yeah. More along these six dimensions that get filled up. Yes. One of the consequences of general relativity is that the universe is expanding. Mm. Uh, is there something like that? Would these six curled up dimensions also expand eventually? What you, have to, you have to kind of look at it case by case. Uh, so, so are there stable situations or... There, there are stable situations, but not, right. So you can definitely write down geometries that give you nice stable situations with zero cosmological constant in four dimensions, with negative cosmological constant in four dimensions, but it's been really hard to get positive cosmological constant in four dimensions. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. That is, again, it's, you, you know, all manner of things can, can happen. Yeah. Yeah. It may be very important to, you know, mention this, but not all the theories are devoid of that. Hashtag not all Susie theories, yeah. You only need one. No, well, okay. Um, yes, they, you know, that's true, yeah. These ones are. Yeah. Oh. So when you said that we will create a new creating power, so did the string theory dream would be cut up on the map? Yes. I think that over there is no more than you will Oh, I, I, I completely agree. They just have to not put that down play. Right? No, you're right. You're right. You're right. So, yeah. Lose, this is, again, yeah, relative to the extremely optimistic uh, rhetoric that was coming out in the 80s that all we had to do was figure out the right geometry and we'd be 
calculating the mass of the electron and just uh, just going to town. That that is long dead, I think. But yeah, uh, Vivek. Um, somewhat, yeah. So the idea is that, like, at very high energies, this compact geometry is, you know, might not be determined. And so you might have a huge universe, and in different kind of bubbles, different pockets of the of this huge universe, you settle into other geometries. Just like, you know, if you have some complicated potential and you drop ping pong balls everywhere, some of them will settle here, some of them will settle here, some of them will settle here. The difference is with gravity, wherever you settle... Uh, you're, you know, if you settle at a positive energy density, you'll start inflating. And so you're never going to be able to visit those other pockets because they're inflating away faster than you'll ever get there. And yeah. And there's all sorts of other issues that people come up with. Yeah, Cecilia. How does the theory change depending on like, all the experiments that you get, for example, from the Right. So how does that affect <sighs> The sad, uncomfortable truth is that at the moment it doesn't really, right? So there's, there's no... So if you're, if you're a, an avid follower of Popper, you do not like string theory because at the moment it's not really disprovable, right? Um, I mean, you know, there are some crazy things where if it happened we'd say, okay, you know, it doesn't work, but then neither does any other theoretical particle physics. But in principle, it can be. It's just that we can't have accelerators that go to you know, 10 to the 15 GeV or whatever. Um, so in, in principle, if we could accelerate things to Planck scale or, or even a little bit below Planck scale, we would see distinctive signs of string theory. But we don't know how to do that. Hopefully, observations of early cosmology might help. Um, and then there's another hope, which I'll, I'll get to in a slide or two. So just to clarify, what you're saying is that right now the experiment has to catch up. No, no, that is not what I'm saying. Right now I'm saying is that, I mean, it's basically physically impossible for the experiments to catch up to the theory. Right now we need to bring the theory down to where we can actually make testable predictions. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. Um, so that's that's a different that's a different side of the story and a very pretty side, uh, which I wasn't really going to talk about today. So, but the idea there is that string theory gives you a huge source of examples of of you know quantum systems that in many cases you have multiple ways of looking at, multiple ways of trying to calculate in. So string theory's got lots of quote unquote dualities. And so there are, you know, these strongly coupled systems, like, like in the quark gluon plasma, there are very similar systems that you can get from a string theory construction, but in the string theory construction, you've got access to another way of computing in them, where you can actually do perturbative calculations. They're not exactly the QGP system that you want, but they're, you know, sort of qualitatively similar, and so then you can do these calculations in this qualitatively similar strongly coupled system using string theory tools and then make predictions. And so there actually were things like this, uh, this what, eta over s, this viscosity bound mm -hmm. that you, you got in this way and this was sort of a, you know, <laughs> soft prediction that there'd be this bound on this, this property in, in physical systems. Um, it's a maximum viscosity that is physically attainable, although I believe there are plenty of asterisks and stuff on that statement. Um, but sure enough, as they went into these quark, you know, Rick and other places actually went and tried to measure it, they seemed to get really close, but not above this bound. Are you talking about this regular um, I'm not an expert exactly on how it's measured or anything like that, so <laughs> I'm, I'm hesitant to, yeah. But it's like well, you know, classical fluid, you're talking about. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, th I think that's right. Yeah. 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 
I, I will hopefully mention that. <laughs> I probably won't actually at this rate, but yes, go ahead. No, that's fine, yeah. Please. Why is it that the super partners have a heavier mass? Why is it the same kind of symmetry, no matter an antimatter would have the same What causes the change? Supersymmetry breaking. The fact that there's not supersymmetry at very low energies means it's broken somewhere. And that breaking scale basically leads to a mass splitting. No, but I, I know that I'm going to go a little deeper. It's why is supersymmetry broken, but like matter anti symmetry broken? Well, wait. It isn't matter anti matter symmetry broken? Well, but I mean, it's just mass, so it's not. Yeah, okay, good. That's what you mean. Yes, there's no mass splitting. Yes, correct. I mean, CPT is much more fundamental than okay. supersymmetry or any other symmetry, basically. That's, I think, the only answer I can really give. Yeah. All right, so very, very lightning quick review of some subsequent developments between about the early 80s and now. Um, so there had been a few different constructions of supersymmetric string theories, and it was actually realized in the 90s. So again, it was, you know, the optimists in the 80s were like, okay, we just have to figure out which string theory and which six-dimensional geometry, and then we'll have solved everything. In the 90s, it was realized that actually these string theories were all related to each other by various limits. You know, strong coupling of one guy get sent you to another guy and things like that. Um, which, so there was no right string theory. They were all connected. Um, and there was a lot of really rich uh, structure in the way they were connected, so what we call dualities. So that led to a lot of work. Uh, another type of duality is what's called ADS-CFT duality. ADS stands for anti de Sitter, which is a negatively curved spacetime, you know, uh, highly symmetric spacetime. CFT is conformal field theory. And it turned out that uh, if you have quantum gravity, which in practice meant string theory, because that's the only quantum gravities we had, you have quantum gravity on anti de Sitter space, it was physically equivalent, meaning there was a dictionary between all observables you could do, all experiments you could try to run, a dictionary between quantum gravity in anti de Sitter space and a conformal theory without gravity in one dimension less. That's weird, but passes many checks. Um, it's not clear if this is something intrinsic to string. I think most people would say now it's actually something intrinsic to quantum gravity itself. But string theory well, so gave it. A of that for, say, loop quantum gravity, right? No, because loop quantum gravity is not consistent, as far as I know. <laughs> if it was, then then I would believe there would be. But um, there's also, you know, there's lots of beautiful connections. So a lot of my, you know, much of my research in the past is focused on kind of connections between the geometry of this internal space we've been talking about and the effective theory in three plus one dimensions. You know, the topology of the internal space gives rise to you know, various properties in, in the effective theory, the spectrum of massless particles or BPS particles or something and so on. Uh, so another one, which is kind of related to what some people have touched on here, something called swampland conjectures have been quite active. So the idea of the swampland is that actually most quantum field theories can't consistently be con coupled to quantum gravity. And that... If you want to do that, you, there's a bunch of sort of consistency conditions that those quantum field theories have to satisfy. And so that's great news if you're worried about this predictability issue, right? Because it's not that you can get every effective theory you want. The fact that it's consistently coupled to gravity in at arbitrarily high energies, the claim is really heavily constrains your effective theories. Um, and so kind of developing that into a really tight framework where you can actually start to maybe make predictions or you know things for actual experiments we're still a ways from that but that's sort of the hope of that program okay in the last one minute plus extra time because you know all the questions uh, i'm going to quickly go through a couple areas of my own research um, before i do any any other questions about the story so far. 
Yes. Correct. I I'm not totally sure there's a theory now that predicts that, but <laughs> they're still called swampland conjectures. But yeah. So speaking of Susie, <laughs> uh, where the heck is it? Um, people really wanted LHC to see supersymmetry, and uh, it, they did not. So that, you know, it's OK. Again, irrelevant to Cecilia's question, this does not rule string theory out. You, know, you have to, uh, string theory is way up here where you can't reach it. <laughs> but you know, so it's not necessarily inconsistent. In fact, the SUSY we needed to get the consistent string theory to get rid of the tachyon was actually just SUSY in the two-dimensional theory, not supersymmetry in the target space-time, which was our universe. And so you can have non-supersymmetric string theories, in fact. Uh, I'll mention that in a second. But most of the theories that have been studied mostly have supersymmetry in both. And so then you have to figure out how to break the supersymmetry at sort of low energies where, again, by low I mean like 100 TeV or something, um, low compared to the Planck scale. But, you know, you don't need that. It could be that Susie's just not, you know, Susie's not only broken it up at the Planck scale. That is a possibility. But a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to understand, you know, what kind of patterns you would get from trying to start with supersymmetry at the Planck scale and then you break it at some lower scale and what does that look like in the standard model or for physics just beyond the standard model and so on. Um, okay, so what have I done in this area? So I, I had a recent paper with a couple collaborators uh, at Chicago where we took a bit of a different approach. So Hassan actually briefly mentioned there is a tachyon-free non-supersymmetric string theory. Well, it's supersymmetric in the two dimensions again to get rid of the tachyon, but it's not supersymmetric in space time. These things have not been very well studied, partly because people are really kind of addicted to the way supersymmetry guarantees a bunch of things don't, you know, you don't get corrections of all sorts of things, types. But uh, what we decided to do was to take that non supersymmetric string theory uh, up in 10 dimensions and just say, okay, we're going we're gonna to deal with this. Maybe it's not even, you know, maybe there's non-perturbative instabilities and stuff, but at least it's perturbatively stable, we're going to try to look at compactifications. So we actually looked at a compactification on uh, this space, so ADS3 cross S3 cross S3 cross S1, down here, uh, and we got, uh, yeah, actually in really good shape. It was perturbatively stable, we could make it weakly coupled, um, and we even had a f sort of a, a class of solutions where it was kind of intrinsically quantum. If you just took the two derivative, you know, low energy action, you, you didn't have a solution. You had to include loop effects. Um, but the string coupling was still small. But anyway, it, it's an interesting laboratory, and I'm quite excited to try to push on that a little bit more in, in coming years and months. Is there anything you can do about the anti receptor part? Ah, yeah, good. So again, we, we were hopeful. <laughs> but no, sure enough. So, yeah, good. that's a good excuse for me to say a couple other things. Sure enough, no matter how we messed with our parameters, we could get that cosmological constant up pretty close to zero, but not across. Even though, like, you know, the one loop effects we could get were big, but then other things balanced and conspired to give us negative cosmological constant again. So one of these swampland conjectures is actually that there cannot be eternal de Sitter space in quantum gravity. This is, I think, maybe the least well, this is the, the Swampland conjecture was sort of the least evidence and support. But this kind of thing happens, has been happening in string theory a lot. People have this great idea for how to get the sitter out of string theory and it falls apart. And it does kind of feel like maybe there's something deep there. So what the Swampland people suggest 
Not that the measurements are wrong, of course. What they suggest is that maybe what we have is a, a potential that doesn't actually have a minimum, but is just exponentially falling off towards zero. And we're very slowly rolling it. So it's like a quintessence type picture. And so the positive energy density we're getting is, you know, a tiny exponentially small amount of potential energy and then a little bit of kinetic energy from the rolling fields. And they, the, the idea is this is not inconsistent with cosmological measurements. But yeah, so if this is right, you, you just cannot have an actual de Sitter minimum in your potential. I don't know. Um, it's okay if I still go a little longer. One more topic. So this has been dominating a lot of my research thinking in the past uh, three years or so. So there, we're really undergoing a revolution in how we think about symmetries in quantum theories. So um, in classical mechanics, Noether's theorem is one of the, you know, one of the great results in, 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 classical, in, in physics. Um, tells us that if you have a continuous symmetry, you get an associated conserved quantity, a conserved charge. So in quantum mechanics, you would have the same kind of thing. So what is that conserved charge? It would be some operator that you can put on the world line, measure that charge at this point in time. And what does conserved mean? It means it commutes with the Hamiltonian so that you can freely move it up and down in time evolution willy-nilly. So if I measure the charge here, it's the same as measuring it here further up along the world line. Now, if at some point I put an operator that like, you know, changed my target space metric or something, that's different. If I cross Q across that guy, I might change the value of Q. But as long as I don't hit another operator, I can put Q anywhere along here and it gives exactly the same result. That's what it means to be a, a symmetry in some sense. In the modern language, what we would say is that this operator is topological, meaning we can deform where its position is and it doesn't change any of our answers. In mathematics, again, topology, like with the handles, is stuff that doesn't change under deformations. So this actually works a lot more generally. So in quantum, in quantum mechanics, um, yeah, so we've got the operators that commute with the Hamiltonian, so are topological, and so they're symmetries. And you can do that um, either with continuous symmetries, like we had with another theorem, but you can also do it with discrete symmetries. There's some unitary operators that commute with the Hamiltonian. If you go to higher dimensional QFT, it's a bit more complicated. Now your charge is something you would integrate over space. So in that same kind of language, I'll think about it as an operator that's attached to a space-like slice. And saying it's conserved, saying it's a you know, constant in time, means I can move that slice up and down in time, and it won't change the answer. And in fact, if I have a conserved current, or, or even you know, there's discrete analogs, what I really want conserved to mean is something even stronger. It's something local, so that I can actually deform that space-like slice. It's not just that I can move it up and down. I can add wiggles or whatever. It won't change the answer. Um, and so, Again, in QFT, you say a symmetry is associated to a topological co-dimension one operator. Okay, if you've got these topological co-dimension one operators, what can you do with them? I don't have to just put them on spatial slices. I could put them in the time direction and then make them a domain wall in space. If I take a domain wall and make it as a, like a sphere around a point particle or a local operator, that's measuring the charge of that local operator in, under this symmetry. So I would have a picture like this that just is sort of the procedure to measure the charge. If I've got two of these domain walls, I can bring them together. We call it fusion. And you know, I'll get another domain wall and by the properties, that new guy is also topological. So every symmetry gives a topological domain wall defect operator. What about the other direction? So that's where the, the revolution has come. So I think it had already started in condensed matter physics, and I don't know how long ago because I, I don't follow that closely enough. But for particle physics, it came in, I think, late 2014 in a paper by uh, Gaiotto, Kapustin, Seiberg, and Willett. And they just turned this around. Said, okay, what are the topological operators in our theory? What can we do with them? Indeed, some of them are ordinary symmetries. But you can have topological operators that are not domain walls. They're lower dimensional things. 
those correspond to higher form symmetries. If they're continuous, they'd have some you know, gauge potential that's not just a vector now, but is like an anti-symmetric tensor of some rank. But you also have these guys that are discrete. And you can look at those. Also, you've got guys that aren't actually unitary in some sense. They're, they're not invertible. So when you fuse them together, rather than just getting a third, you know, D1 and D2 gives a D3, you can get a sum of things. This structure actually shows up. So these guys are called non-invertible topological operators. They're not, they don't form a group. They form a fusion category. Or, and the uh, crazy thing is they seem to be there, <laughs> even in very familiar theories, in the standard model, in lots of simple condensed matter theories. These non-invertible symmetries are there <laughs> and actually tell you things. They're not quite as powerful as the invertible ones, but still you get selection rules, you get ward identity type things, you get all sorts of the games you could play with ordinary symmetries, you can now play with these guys. So a lot of my work, I'm just gonna really skim over this page, thinking about the topological point operators version of this, which in some sense is trivial, but then when you think about how it connects to the other stuff, it's slightly less trivial, and so we feel justified writing several papers about it. Um, and then I'm really excited about some stuff I'm working on right now that hopefully will come out this month where we're actually taking these non-invertible guys and thinking about gauging them. Um, this has been discussed before. People sort of know how to do this in principle, but it's one of those things where everybody says, this is how you do it in principle, and nobody actually sat down and did it in practice, and that's what we've tried to work out how to do. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, modulo late hurdles. That should hopefully be coming out in a couple weeks. Uh, what is gauging in this language? It's actually, at least for discrete symmetries, it's essentially you take your defects, whatever defect corresponding to the symmetry you want to gauge, and you're just flooding your space-time with it. And you, you do a sum over all different networks of defects that you could do. This is the direct analog of doing the path integral over uh, your background gauge fields. Background gauge fields essentially correspond to these networks. And you want to sum over them. If you, if, to gauge the symmetry, you sum over all configurations of background fields, essentially promoting it to dynamical. All right, so that, that's, the, uh, that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? Or should we let everybody leave? <laughs> there were a lot of questions during the talk, so. Couple minutes for questions. If there are any quick questions, sure. Yeah. Just a comment. <laughs> Very good. In Yeah, very good, very good, absolutely. So if I'm remembering correctly what texture actually means, uh, absolutely. So I said that the charge was associated to a spatial slice. That would be your texture. But if you sort of rotate it in space time and you know, we're just doing topology, no metric really in talking about this stuff. So it's not that I'm really rotating something, I can just say, or I can have this don't, you know, co-dimension one thing, wrapping a time-like slice. Then it looks like a defect. So they're really the same objects, just whether I'm extended in time or not. So then that we I'm trying to construct a geometrical picture of what's going on. So if one often talks about um, stresses and strains of these textures and mm -hmm. associates terms like bend, splay, and twist okay. to them, and they're associated with particular kinds of defects, and I'm curious to know if that language has crossed that, that language has not yet permeated, at least in the circles I move in, um, but it, it may well. We're, the last few years, along with this, has seen a lot closer discussion between certain corners of condensed matter theory and high energy theory, which I think has been really healthy, at least for us. I don't know if it's actually healthy for them, but it's, it's at least really healthy for us. Um, Probably one final comment. One one 
piece that's always intrigued me is the household stylus transition where you have it's it's very costly to have an isolated singularity mm. but if you have paired mm -hmm, mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. opposite circulation say right um, like a vortex anti-vortex anti yeah much lower than one and then you can look for the unpairing yep. transition yeah yeah, so that's, that's not topological because there is a change in energy as you're pulling them apart. But um, indeed, so I was only, in the generalized symmetries, only talking about topological defects and topological operators. All these QFTs also have non-topological defects and, and operators as well. And in fact, there's a class called conformal defects that I'm also very interested in where you preserve some of the conformal symmetry but it's still not topological. So it costs energy to move it, but it still has a lot of nice properties. And I, I would be interested to know if something like that could be discussed there. That, that's interesting. So, so may, may I think back of that because it's, sure. it's interesting. The, the dislocations in crystals yep. are something that is very closely associated with torsion. Uh, hmm. Anyway, so my question is, what's the status of torsion in, in theories that are related to Wait, so torsion is a very overloaded term. So what torsion do you mean well, exactly? I mean the symbols that are Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really talk about you know, the various massless fields you get out of string theory, but one of them is an anti-symmetric tensor. And indeed, it actually does, in many circumstances, pair very naturally with the Christoffel symbols to give you a sort of connection with torsion. It, it's the sort of thing where you don't have to use it, but it's the sort of thing where many formula, in certain circumstances, many formulas become simpler if you say, oh, I'm going to write this as this connection with torsion. Then okay. my action is suddenly two terms instead of 14 terms or something, so right? Otherwise, you just say it's an anti-symmetric field. Yeah, it's an anti-symmetric field. Right, so it's, it's a B mu nu. It's got a field strength that's like an H mu nu rho that's totally anti-symmetric. Okay. And then you basically take, you know, raise one index and add it to the Christoffel symbol with, you know, a plus or minus a half or something, I can't remember. Yeah. 